All right. We are here for another one of our back and forth episodes. Uh, this is Ryan Delaney, Chief Analyst at the Coffee Trading Academy, uh, along with my friend and colleague, Igor, joining us from uh, sunny Brazil, um, sweltering in the heat and his Coffee Trading Academy <laughs> vest. How's it going, Igor? Yeah. <laughs> All good, Ryan. So it's been a while we don't do our podcast and things have evolved in the market. Lots of things have happened, especially over the last two months. Right. Uh, we can start saying that the market is overall in a downtrend since the, the highs we've seen last year. For but sure. now it seems like it is finding some range there. And that's our starting point of our discussion. So I wanted to bring this up to you. We see that the market uh, decreased down to 140, 150 back in January. But now it looks like it is more uh, in or in range as it moved up from February. Right. And, and we are in actually in an inflection point because there are some interesting developments in technicals that would suggest that we might go lower from here. So I wanted mm -hmm. to start by that. Uh, what the heck is going on in cough? Can you give me can you give us a, a little bit of your view based on this? Uh, yeah, I would love to, Igor. So that's a good question, and, and thanks. That's a good good overview as well. Um, so we have some charts here. We can take a look uh, at what you were just talking about, in fact, um, for our, our video viewers. For those of us who are just listening to this on the podcast, we'll, we'll describe what's going on so you guys uh, don't feel left out, so you all feel included. So I'm looking right now at just what you were talking about, Igor, uh, an Arabica coffee chart uh, over the last one year. And people might be surprised to hear you talk about a bearish downtrend, uh, given the rally we had from January up through March. But if we look at the broader context, if we pull back here, you can see that this is very clearly a downtrend uh, from the highs uh, of in the, the 240s or so back in June of 22, all the way down uh, to where we are today at 174.50 um, in, uh, in right at the end, almost the beginning of April here, uh, 2023. Wow, time's really, really moving fast. So the, if you look at this chart here and you and you draw a downtrend on it, you can see that even if the market rallied up to 190, 200, even 210, this would still be a, a, a intact downtrend. And that's where the market is at the moment. Now that can change, uh, but right now it looks like a downtrend. You also mentioned one other thing here, which is uh, a potential bearish signal. And uh, this is it's uh this used to be a shampoo in the US. I don't know if you've ever uh, if you had that shampoo in Brazil. Uh but what's the what's the pattern we're looking at here? This is the head and shoulders pattern. It is exactly. usually a uh it's a pattern that signals uh, a beer trend. So it we we might uh be it looking at lower. yeah, the starts of a move lower from the 170s maybe to 150s from here. All right. Now, I know you studied whether... this a little bit, Igor. So can yeah. you tell our listeners, for those who aren't familiar, what is a head and shoulders pattern? What does it look like in general? And, and what is the where does this take place within the context of the price action in Arabica coffee this year? So basically, a head and shoulders pattern uh, comes right after a, a bull trend. In this case, what we're looking at it would be the bull trend from January to February. So right. if you see at the, for those who are viewing this in a, in a video and not in a podcast, you are able to see in that first half of the, of the chart there that the market is moving up in a, in a, in a pattern that uh, it, it mirrors, let's say. Right, it's, kind of it's a uh, symmetrical. The, it's exactly. symmetrical. We got the shoulders at the left, Mm -hmm. the head which is the highs of this trend at the middle and then in the right we got another shoulders and you can see that the levels match within the shoulders so that's right. the stop of this trend uh if prices would move let's say above 185 this pattern would all right you're you're breaking up here a little bit so let me try to 
you're, you're breaking up here a little bit. So let me try to recap what you just said. The price, what a head and shoulders pattern looks like is three triangles, right? Three triangles uh, put next to each other. So um, that would be 150, about almost like a almost like a mountain range silhouette, right? Yes, so exactly. It looks like the a left shoulder is the price action going up in this case to the 180s and then coming back down to around 170. The head is the middle triangle and that is going up to 190s, maybe 194, something like that, and then back down to 170. So that's the middle triangle or the head. And then the third triangle or the right shoulder is going back up to the 180s, maybe 184, and then back down to 170. Now, the bottoms of each of those lower portions here is called the neckline. The top of the two shoulders is the shoulder line. And what you were just alluding to when you said uh, in order for this pattern to be broken is called the stop loss. Now, the entry point for this pattern is when the price action breaks below the neckline. And that's what we just saw two days ago in price action. So if we look at uh, our little chart here, you can see uh, I drew the, the, the neckline in. And then, uh, so today's Friday, Thursday, Wednesday afternoon, prices settled below that neckline and that is the breakout. In other words, that's the signal uh, to enter into a bearish trade on this uh, market. Now, I don't advise or not advise doing that. Let me be clear. I'm not giving you a, <laughs> uh, I'm not giving you a trading signal here, but that is the traditional read of how you look at this pattern. And then what you had just mentioned is the stop loss above the, the right shoulder here. So tell us about that, Igor. That would be the line we would use as a benchmark in this case that would nullify this pattern. And then we would stop seeing it as a head and shoulders. So, Correct. so that in order be... for that to happen, that would be a hundred. And I think just by looking at it, 185. We're right. 15 cents below it right now, I think. So it's a bit uh, far away. Exactly. So that would be our stop loss. Uh, if the market goes back up above 185 or so, then we can nullify this pattern and say it was a failed head and shoulders top. Um, but as of now, this pattern is active. And so the target would be something like 22 cents lower. So uh, 172-ish to 194 is the height of this pattern. And so you take that same distance and apply it below. And so 22 cents, so 172 minus, one, minus 22 cents would be about 150. So that would be the target. That would be the price target for this pattern. Now, some people hate technical analysis. Some people love it. You know, some people say it's all a bunch of, you know, uh, hocus pocus and gobbledygook. And, you know, fair enough. That's fine. I don't want to disagree with anybody or change their mind if they don't like technical analysis. But what is this paired with, Igor, that we've been uh, looking in? What's right around, what's right next door to you? Right next door is the Brazil crop. We're actually approaching exactly. the, the harvest. Yeah. So and we are... Also Go ahead. No, I was going to say, since people, uh, not all people believe in technicals and they want on a, another view of the market, uh, what do you think of the fundamentals then? What's your view on the fundamentals? What's happening now? Are we in a period of tightness? Are we in a period of of loser fundamentals? What do you right. think? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a good question. And, and in fairness, that's where we like to start, right? That's where we usually like to start talking is about what is happening in the fundamentals and I think that's really where coffee experts add the most value as well, because you can be a technical analysis expert and talk about any market, but you have to be a coffee person to understand the fundamentals in coffee. So let's start with the big picture here uh, and look at our balance sheet. And we've been working hard on this balance sheet, <laughs> Igor. Uh, uh, we've been doing a lot of research, sure. um, interviewing yeah. different people in origins, looking at the, the export data and the weather data to try to reconcile what is going on, what the heck is going on, and uh, uh, what is the, the supply and demand balance. So what is the what, what, do, what, do, you, what, what do you consider to be the recent uh, history, the context, Igor, in, in the balance sheet? 
I think it's notorious that we come from uh, two bad crops from Brazil because of weather, right. adverse weather events, especially the frost. Uh, but now it seems like things are moving in another direction. So winds are changing and we might actually see better crops ahead. The 23, 24 crop is not supposed to be a record crop, not something like the, the 20 crop, right. but it's actually improving. So that would uh, help the balance sheet. Uh, and you can see there is pseudo to a surplus. So yeah. that's how the winds are changing there in the balance sheet. Yeah, no, I think you summarized that well. Um, as, you, as you said, most people would agree, if not everybody uh, who knows anything about coffee, that uh, we're coming off of two back-to-back -back deficits, probably very bad deficits, uh, but at least moderate deficits. And that's unusual. It's not rare per se, but it's unusual in the coffee market to have uh, two years of, of, of lower uh, of, of drawdowns in stock, right? Deficits. So that's the, the total coffee picture. Now, going into this year, into 23-24, um, which the, the Brazil crop of the 23-24 uh, season is, is going to be basically next month, April, May-ish, it's going to start. Um, that season, we had been expecting an okay surplus before, but that surplus has been diminishing, right? Now, to your point, Igor, the Brazil crop looks okay, right? It's not, um, it's not a great crop. It's not a terrible crop. It's a lot better than the two bad crops we had over the last two years that really drove the deficits, but it's not a big bumper crop either. In fact, I just saw a friend of mine post online recently, uh, and she was talking about, hey, is this a, um, a bad on cycle or a good off cycle? And, and her point was that it's actually a, a very good off cycle crop. Those of you who don't know, the Brazil uh, crop tends to have a, an on crop and an off crop or a bumper crop and an off crop. Um, and that's because the, the coffee plant actually gets tired to metaphorically, where it uses up all of its resources to produce a very big, strong crop. And then the next year, it's not able to produce such a big crop anymore. It sort of rests for a year and produces a little bit less. And then the following year, it produces a big crop again. So if you look at, uh, Igor mentioned the 2020 crop, that was a big one. So uh, 21 would be a small one. 22 would then be a big one again, but they got uh, walloped by uh, weather and other things. So that ended up being a bad crop. So then the 23 crop, the crop we're in now, should technically be an off crop, right? So it goes on crop, off crop, on crop, off crop. So what some people are saying is that we have either a very good off-year crop or a bad on-year crop. Now, it's a little bit semantics, I think, because my understanding is that the crop can kind of reset. So if you have a bad crop one year in Brazil, um, then the next year is usually good. And if you have a particularly good year, then, um, then the next year could be, could be not so good. Um, but that kind of remains to be seen. Um, doesn't really matter because we have forecasts out there. We have crop counters out there. And uh, I don't know if we included the slide in this presentation, but I would say consensus Brazil crop is probably between 61, 62 million bags and 67 million bags, something like that. I think we've got an average of about 64, 65 million bags. Uh, we're we're closer to 65 million bags. But the important thing here is that the balance sheet has been getting tighter. We had that crop up closer to 68 million bags before earlier this year. And then that has been diminishing as we get closer to the crop and we are able to do more counting and 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 see the numbers. Um, and that's what that's what we're seeing. So that translates into the balance sheet and where we had a very big or at least comfortable, a little more comfortable surplus for 23, 24. Now that is a lot closer to flat, right? Now we're just a little bit of a tiny surplus. Um, and if we break down the total coffee surplus into Arabica and Robusta, 
we have a deficit in Arabica and a moderate to small surplus in Robusta. Now, we've been making some, some key changes in the S&D here recently, uh, particularly in Robusta, right, Igor? So what are the, some of the... What are some of the, the major origins we've had looked at lately in Robusta? Lately, we've been looking at Vietnam. We also changed some numbers in Uganda. We're updating our view there. Right. Uh, the main changes to our balance, which before was displaying a, a higher surplus mm -hmm. in total, these changes came mostly from Robusta. We've been reducing right. our Robusta, but we also reduced a bit in our Arabica. Uh, right now, I think we are in a tight surplus, although we have some space to increase in our robust balance, we're still going to be in an overall uh, tight balance for 23. Yeah, I think that's right. One of the, the controversies, though, just to add to the other side of it, though, is that whereas we, we agree with um, uh, a lot of people who've been reducing their, uh, their production, especially in uh, Vietnam and Uganda. Uganda was hit by uh, droughts um, that really uh, reduced expected production there. Um, we've heard that Indonesia um, is down some as well uh, because of uh, issues of excess rain there. We're not quite as pessimistic on Indonesia as some are, but uh, but we do acknowledge that there's been there's been issues there. So we we brought some of those numbers down. And Vietnam is a little bit. We're a little. We've heard kind of both sides of the story here. Some people are saying that hey, Vietnam is is, is lower. Other people have said actually it's it's a higher crop or about the same, a little bit higher than last year, but that farmers have held back. They did very good sales in the beginning of the year, um, or rather good volume in the beginning of the year, and now that they've seen prices rise. They're like, oh, whoops, we sold too much. Let's let's wait for prices to rally so we can we can sell some more. That's, so we've heard kind of both both sides of that story there, um, but the the controversial part is the demand, and what we've been hearing is that there has been a large demand shift from Arabica to Robusta. Now the the primary uh, paradigm I would say is that people generally prefer to drink Arabica coffee, so that is what is consumed first if available. If Arabica gets cheap, uh, excuse me, if Arabica gets expensive, then people will shift, they'll downshift to that Robusta. So particularly when we see big rallies in Arabica, uh, we see the Robusta market uh, tend to benefit from that and, and get consumption. So the controversial part is that some people are saying that there is a lot of new Robusta demand. And so that, you know, you, you could argue that our Robusta balance sheet is too high if that's true. Um, and other people are just saying it's a little bit, you know, some, you know, some increase, but that the Arabica demand is more sticky. So those are some of the, the, the controversies going out. But if we wanted to summarize all of what we just said, I think we can summarize it like this. We're coming out of a period of tightness and deficit and very shortly into a period of either a much better deficit at the worst or possibly a flat to surplus market. So it's an improvement in the fundamentals. Moreover, there tends to be consensus that one year forward, there will be an excellent Brazil crop. And what is it we always say about coffee, Igor? Coffee is forward looking, right? Um, yes, exactly. Right now, what's happening in the market is not necessarily reflecting the the current fundamentals or the fundamentals of uh, well, one week one week ago. Uh, it's actually looking at the future, next three, uh, four, six months, the next Brazil crop. What's likely to drive diffs, the spreads, the certs. So that's our basic ass assumption when analyzing the, the the futures market. There, that's the absolutely coffee. right, because not only because people have access to information and can see somewhat into the future, but also because we're using a futures market, right? So business is being booked with futures and forward contracts, three months, five months, six months, even a year or two in the future, that business is being done. And so people are trading off of those time periods. And so what is happening in the present is old news. Um, and it's even what's happening a month or two forward is old news. 
you know, we're really trading five months, six months, a year out. And that is why we care what the estimates are for that 24, 25 uh, Brazil crop. Oh, it hey, looks like we do have our Brazil crop forecast here. <laughs> so for those who got who who wanted to see it, uh, for those of you on the podcast, what we're showing here is a, a, a bundle of estimates on the Brazil crops, uh, estimates for the 23-24 crop uh, forecasts. We have uh, we have data here from uh, traders and uh, importers, banks, um, and anal uh, and um, basically brokers, those type of things, financial institutions, and the prices the the Estimates range from 62 million up to 67.5 uh, with an average of 65.6. All right, what else do, do we need to talk about today, Igor? Did I lose you? Are you still there? All right, it looks like we lost Igor for a second here. Uh, but basically the one thing we do need to talk about are calendar spreads. So with calendar spreads, we have seen some very interesting price action, especially in Robusta. Now the Robusta market, um, I made the mistake of shorting calendar spreads in the Robusta market um, back when I was trading in uh, a prop desk. Um, and I, I learned a lesson that I always repeat, which is never short Robusta calendar spreads based on fundamentals. Now. Why is that? It's because the Robusta market is uh, a smaller market with a fewer big players, and therefore uh, they can really impact calendar spreads in a big way. Igor, welcome back. I'm just talking about uh, calendar spreads in Robusta here. Um, and I was talking about why you never short uh, robusta calendar spreads uh, in um, based on fundamentals. And I think we, that's a hard game. We're yeah, seeing exactly. There. Now, I was uh, explaining this to you the other day. Uh, what do you, what is the driver that we see for for any calendar spreads? Certificates, uh, the market's perception of tightness or availability of stocks, and uh, in robusta, that doesn't necessarily reflect these dynamics because the market is small, the position limits are way higher than in, than in a Arabica. Right. So spreads are more vulnerable in this market. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I think it's still the certified stocks, but there is some difference uh, into what uh, the impact of those certified stocks are what and what they mean. Do we have a, a chart on the certified stocks in here? Uh, we don't have Robusta in here, do we? I don't think we have a chart showing Robusta, um, but I can describe what the Robusta certified inventory looks like. If you look at a five-year chart, it's kind of a wavy, um, if you look at a five-year chart of the Robusta certified inventory, it's kind of a cyclical highs and lows, uh, but in kind of a range, in kind of a sideways range. And the current Robusta inventory is near the lows of that range, but rallying a bit. So in other words, we've been getting new Robusta certified inventory, but it's still in the lower part of that range. Now, what Igor was alluding to that's important and for, uh, for the Robusta calendar spreads is the position limits. So the problem with uh, the position limits is that in Arabica, you have a 5,000 lot position limit for any futures month. But as you get to first notice day, as you get to notice period, then you can only hold 500 lots. That's it. 500 lots, any single trader uh, into notice period without uh, uh, an exemption. In Robusta, which is already a smaller market, there is a 7,500 lot position limit. So that means as opposed to 5,000 in Arabica, any trader can hold 7,500 lots in Robusta. and as far as I know, and feel free to correct me, someone, if you know differently, there is no notice period difference. So it's just 7,500 lots. And that means a trader can potentially hold all of those uh, futures into notice period. What does that mean? 
that means if you, if let's say there's uh, only 10,000 lots of open interest and you own 7,500, if the market goes into notice period, someone else is on the other side of those lots that you own. So if you tell them, hey, I want to, I want to deliver, I want you to deliver to me the coffee and you own those 7,500 lots. And at the same time, you own 50% or 60% of the certified inventory in Robusta, you can guarantee that the other side of your trade does not have the coffee to deliver to you. What does that mean? It means that they will have to pay whatever you ask to get out of their position. And that's called a squeeze. Now, I'm not sure that that is exactly what happened in Robusta. Um, and I don't uh, want to accuse anybody of anything. And I don't, you know, I don't have any secret information here. I'm just explaining what the vulnerability is and how that market can uh, get pushed around by people with big positions. So going back to the calendar spreads, because of that factor, as we get into first notice day or towards first notice day, we can see big spikes in the calendar spreads. And, and that's what we saw in Robusta. They've come off a bit now, but they're still high, especially in the front month. The whole curve is inverted. Um, and uh, that is one potential reason why. Now, Arabica spreads are a different story, aren't they, Igor? What's going on in Arabica spreads? Yeah, Arabica spreads behave differently. Uh, it's way harder to squeeze the Arabica spreads and reach inversions. For example, like we had last year, uh, if I'm not mistaken, we didn't have any inversions like we had last year uh, for the 90s. Last time it was in the 90s. Right. So it was really a big thing. And then spreads came down because certs came up and then the perception of tightness changed. And now what we are seeing is the spreads uh, accumulating a slight inversion again as the, the certificates come down. And we are passing through a period of tightness right now in the market. We are in between crops. We have the, the next Brazil crop, like we said, coming uh, to the market soon, the new coffees and then the October crops. So it's natural that right now we, we should be drawing down uh, uh, stocks. But with the high diffs, that's even more true because we have less delivers to the board and we have also more incentives to consume uh, certificate coffee so that's why uh, spreads have been moving in this range one to two inversions they might come up a little but we don't expect bigger inversions like we had last year of plus 10. right you uh, that was a very good uh summary there igor you really covered a lot of ground um and i think you you did it well and 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 you covered all the important things so let's try to break down some of what you mentioned there. Number one, we have the certified inventory in Arabica, right? And which is harder to squeeze by any one player because you can only have 500 lots maximum in a bigger market uh, going into notice period. Uh, however, what you can get is a more organic rally in those calendar spreads. So what I mean by organic is that in, rather than one big trader just trying to bully the market in the way that they want, many traders all are need that coffee. And so they're competing with each other. There's more buyers than sellers. And so prices rally. And that's what we saw in Arabica calendar spreads. Um, and we attribute that in part to, uh, in large part to the drawdown in certified inventory. There is a shortage of the coffee that is available to be tendered or exchanged for a future. Now, the certified inventory drew down to a dramatic low level, like you mentioned, the lowest since the 90s, uh, of about uh, 375,000 bags, something like that. Typically, low levels are about a million bags, so we were way below low levels. Then, from November through Jan, uh, we had a rally in the certified inventory. In other words, we had new coffees delivered to the exchange and certified. Um, and, uh, and and that is a little bit controversial as to where those that coffee came from and what kind of coffee it was that was actually certified. But the effect was that it really broke the spreads. Once we saw all of that coffee start to come back into the exchange, then those plus 12 inversions disappeared. 
And it, it was still is not a solved solution yet. And therefore, calendar spreads are still inverted, um, which is significant in Arabica. You know, before we had the inversions of the last two years, uh, over the previous 10, well, the only time we had an inversion was just, I think, once or twice, and it was only for a very short period of time, and it was a very small inversion. Now, we've had a basically year and a half, two-year inversion uh, that reached levels we haven't seen in, in a quarter, you know, similarly in 20-something in years. So this is a, a, an impressive rally in calendar spreads. Now we had that increase in certified inventory that broke the high uh, inversions, but it didn't break the inversion completely. And since January uh, or you know late January, early February, the calendar spreads, the certified inventory has been drawing down again. And just as Igor said, this is to be expected because other differentials for coffees are high. So uh, the attractiveness of consuming certified inventory is there. And on top of that, um, uh, I don't know what on top of that, but we've been drawing down certified inventory. Oh, on top of that, we're in the, uh, the tight period of the year that Igor mentioned. Now, going forward, because coffee is forward looking, we are projecting, and if you can see our screen here, you can see that we have a, a, a picture of the certified inventory of the last six months. It has that uh, shape I just described to you about starting from a low level, then uh, increasing up to about 860,000 bags in uh, late January and is now decreasing again. And we are projecting out that the certified inventory will continue to decrease, but not as badly as before, not as rapid of a pace to about, say, 600,000 bags, and then level off before increasing again. Now, Igor, do you know why we're, um, why we're projecting that? That's several reasons. Uh... But mainly because, like we we were talking just a while ago, we are approaching the Brazil crop, so uh, we should have more availability. And also, diffs are being pressured right now at the moment. So if we think about the diffs, and diffs have a, a, a an interesting dy dynamic correlating to surge consumption, mm -hmm. they're in the highs. So Arabica milds and also Brazilian naturals, they are in the highs. But as you said, demand has been on the sidelines for Arabica and increasing for Robusta. That's one of the reasons that diffs are coming down recently from Brazil, from uh, Colombia, from Central America. So they have been reducing because what we're noticing is that the buyer is dictating the pace uh, of the sales there and the yeah. buyers are a side of the market. So diffs are decreasing. On top of that, the producer who is unhappy with the price, he now has a dilemma because he sees that the diffs are decreasing and they also have new crops ahead. So these upcoming crops should increase competitivity. And then odds are that prices might come even lower. So that means that they, if there is a, a good timing to sell for the producer, in his own view, it might be now because later it might be even lower. So considering right. this dynamic, we think that diffs will reduce we have also more availability of new coffees, and that's likely to help uh, the certified stocks, especially uh, in the October crops as well, when Honduras mm. starts to, to offering coffees. Honduras is a big part of the certifying inventory, uh, just like Brazil. Right. Yeah, no, well, well said. Uh, we, so to recap, we had very high Brazilian differentials. We had very high differentials across the board, Colombians, Centrals, et cetera. And that was incentivizing drawdown in certified inventory. But just as Igor said, differentials have come off. So that's reducing uh, incentive to consume certified inventory. And we are projecting that differentials could continue to come down because now we're going to have the fresh crops. We're going to have in one month, we're going to have Brazil selling coffee, a fully harvested, well, not fully harvested, but in full harvest flowing the coffee. And so any previous coffee that they have, uh, they're going to try to get rid of now because they don't want it to become old crop. They don't want to sell it as old crop. They want to sell it as current crop. And so that is really providing a lot of uh, pressure on differentials. And then just as you mentioned, uh, the Central American uh, countries are going to have their co crops right after Brazil. And unlike the Brazilians, the washed coffees 
you really can't hold on to them. You can't hold on to them for nearly as long. They have to sell them while they're fresh. They have to sell them quickly. Uh, so that coffee uh, is going to start flowing very soon. We've heard that there is a lot of uh, availability in Honduras, especially of washed milds uh, that hasn't been sold. Uh, and there is talk that that could be delivered to the board. Uh, it could be certified um, before the next crop that, you know, people still holding inventory might just try to get rid of it before the next crop comes uh, by selling it to the exchange. Otherwise, they're going to have to sell it as old crop. On top of that, we are going to still get some Brazils, um, uh, some washed Brazils over the next few months. And uh, that is also, those could potentially come to the exchange as well. So that is why we are projecting a, a lower certified inventory over the next month or two, then flattening off as those uh, uh, Brazil coffees become available, and then possibly even increasing as we get some Brazils uh, and then move into the October crops. So that's our, our projection there. And therefore, we would uh, forecast or say there's possibility of the certified, the calendar spreads to have a somewhat inverse relationship. In other words, staying a bit firm as we continue to draw down certified inventory and then leveling off and then maybe um, getting weaker, perhaps even coming back into carry as we go into uh, a increase in certified inventory. All right, I think that's about all the time we have for today. Uh, is there anything else you wanna add before we wrap up, Igor? No, I think that's pretty much it. Uh, I think we've covered uh, from prices to fundamentals. Uh, we analyze, like you said in the beginning, the 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 overview of the fundamentals as a whole in in terms of balance. And now I think uh, we we finish with a good overview of what's happening in the market right now and in the short to medium term. What's our expectation? So I hope everybody uh, can take something out of this. And I think this uh, I wish that this podcast adds to your view. Who is listening? Who is watching the right. video? Yeah, thank you. And I think that's something we always try to tell people is that don't take our view. Um, you never. This is another thing I learned when I was trading is you never want to adopt someone else's view, but always consider what people are saying and use that to challenge your own view and see if that uh, helps you to, to, to help develop your view. And we hope that it does that. We hope that uh, this was helpful for you in discovering what the heck is going on in coffee. If you like this podcast and the material we produce, uh, we send out weekly videos uh, talking about the market in detail to all of our uh, clients, our premium clients. Uh, we also have free uh, research available on the website. So feel free to check that out. All right, everybody, feel free to reach out anytime. Thank you so much. We're looking forward to seeing you all. And uh, yeah. That's what's going on. That's what the heck is going on in coffee. All right. Take care. Thanks, guys. Take care.